internet, this is Sal Good Sam. This video is meant to be kind of a general purpose, mostly focusing on brush tutorial on how to use brush, how to practice strokes, feathering, line control, do studies, etc. It's uh, meant for my students in my classes at Sin Studio and on Patreon. I have student patrons category now on Patreon and if you pledge $35 a month you can send me your homework and I'll give you feedback and help you get better. Uh, you can, anyone can check out these videos and try things out on their own. It's free to use that way. Uh, let me know if you have questions in the comments and check out the doobie -doo for links to my Patreon, my art class sites, and everything else. Uh, hope you enjoy and sorry yeah I fall out of the camera a, a few times. Uh, I had to get in tight so you could see what I was doing with the brush. Mostly you'll be able to see everything and uh, I hope you find it informative. Good luck. Happy doodling. Oh, and by the way, if you want to speed this up, I talk a little slow, and some people don't mind that, but if it bugs you, remember there's a little gear shape control thing on YouTube? You can speed up your videos, and maybe like a 0.5 increase. I'll sound a little like a chipmunk, but it'll all go a lot faster. Okay? We were working on this Milton Kniff piece in class, and I did a, a partial study of it, and uh, I wanted to do some examples of how some of these brush strokes are achieved. So a good chunk of what we see here and here and on the helmet there is just classic feathering. And to quickly explain, I've, I've mentioned this in past videos, but I'm going to do it again here. Feathering is sort of a sweeping stroke as opposed to a dead line or a straight line, a fixed line, when you drop the brush, bring it across and lift it. So I'll just do two. All right, you can do that for a thin line. These are good to practice as well. I can get a thinner one if I hold the brush more vertical. All right, so those are sort of even, consistent. There's no line weight variation, sometimes called a dead line. A feathered line, instead of having that box shape, we're going to swing down and up. There we go. It usually takes me a few goes to get it to be even. When I'm feathering on my art, I, I frequently will do this a bit on a a piece of scratch paper next to the work. And then I usually go pretty quick. But then at first you might want to practice just doing it slowly and evenly. Not too slowly, because then the line gets shakier. And in both of these cases I'm kind of doing hatching. And you'll notice that the hatching lines work best when they're very laminar, very even distance, uh, the spacing is even. You can do them erratically, creates textures, but you want to save that for like grass or some effect where an organic erratic hatching uh, makes the texture you want. Frequently you're using them for describing surface or shading and there you want them to be very even, and then potentially, as we see in this work, sometimes to reflect the shape or form, uh, if only a little bit, of the material. Milton didn't actually curve his feathered lines very much. Most of his strokes are fairly straight. Um, I kind of curve them around forms more, so if I've got a, a round surface, uh, I'll try to... Do feathering that works as though it's on that round surface and follows it. But that can be challenging. Um, you can do it the way Milton did, so you'll see here. He's going to describe light shadow on a, a leather jacket. So there's like a shape like this, and the cuff, and then he's a bit of curvature to them, but they're basically just quick strokes. There, you see that it's pulling back? It's because I didn't lift fast enough. So you want to watch that. 
um, the stroke should be complete before you come back to the next stroke. If you rush it and come back, you'll end up with check marks. You don't want that. So finish the stroke before you return. If you get check marks, it means you're you're hurrying. And sometimes you feather for a thicker stroke like that. I see quite a lot of those doing this leather jacket. Then this kind of stuff, that's using the block wedge. So I'm putting down the brush to a side. Experiment making different shapes. The most basic one I, I recommend in the pattern exercise is to like play with interlocking little brush daubs, which I like to do sometimes for things like scales. You can do it pulling the other way. You can see how it changes the shape of it. And if you want to create some irregularity, sort of organic pattern effect in your scales, moving back and forth from different sort of pulling down to this left or pulling down to the right, it gives you a slightly different shape. And if you just keep pulling forward, you get a, a nice wedge shape. Um, you can do that like that to fill in areas. Now, a quick note. I've said this in other videos, but I'm going to repeat again. A brush always wants to be pulled more or less from its the base of where the bristles are mounted. And you can push to the side because that still kind of pulls on them off to the side. You want to be careful about doing that too much because you can also eventually bend your bristles and uh, lose your point. When you're doing this, you don't mash the brush into the surface. You know, I'm not pushing it down to the point where the base is getting a lot of pressure. Um, so you can pull to the side and you can pull down. If you want to go up, you never want to go into the bristles. First of all, it spreads out. You don't really have any control. Um, and if you do that too much, you'll end up damaging the coherence of the point of the brush. And with felt tips, you'll cause the felt to pull under itself and wear it out really quickly. So if you're going up with a stroke, you have to angle your brush either just vertical or even lean into it a bit, which is something I do sometimes. So I'll do this so I can go up and away from me instead of I'm not going to hold it like I normally do and then do this because the results are just a mess. They're sloppy. So you can hold it vertically, you can hold it a bit of an angle and lean into it. That's good. When you're doing the, the push around kind of wedgy thing, that's fine too, but again, try not to do a lot of pushing up against, you're gonna put a lot of wear on the bristles and push them apart. So, Kniff here does a lot of those kind of wedge shapes using the side of the brush and a lot of um, a lot of feathering. And then he has these nice long contour lines. Now, you want to practice line control generally. So it's like doing varying lengths of as straight as you can lines. And it comes down to like this line, this length. That's just movement of my wrist. If I do that, I'm now moving my elbow a bit. And you have to coordinate it to try to not get the wavers. You can try to make it a, a more fixed line like we did at the beginning. And then you can go even longer. Using your whole arm. So that was my elbow. Uh, wrist and shoulder sort of unfolding, coordinating a longer stroke. Um, and that's good to practice. And then having done that and practicing your feathering and other depth control exercises, you can do a nice long varying. So I'm going with thick on the upstrokes. That's a good way to practice controlling your line weight. Choose if you're going to go thick on the upstroke or on the downstroke and thin on the upstroke. This is essentially like a handwriting exercise. 
but here we're doing it just to draw and render with a brush. So uh, I've mentioned in the past videos, but again for this one I'm going to say, uh, remember that one of the critical uh, points about a brush, I, I've mentioned that you don't want to go against the bristles. Uh, I've talked about uh, deadlines versus feathering and kind of using the brush as a blunt wedge. Um, now the other third really important point is that there isn't the same kind of feedback with a brush as you get with any kind of other implement where there's a, a hard connection with the surface where you can feel it when you draw you can feel the connection um, we get used to that drawing and we don't even notice or think about it but the first thing to say about that is even when you're drawing with a pencil it's actually a really good idea to learn to become a very light sketcher you don't want to over commit to dark marks right away when you're sketching um, you want to be able to develop a drawing and think out the structures without committing to really dark forms that you'll have to work hard to obscure or correct. Um, I also encourage a, a fast gestural drawing style, which is what I use myself. That's why I teach gestures so much. And this helps facilitate that. And then if you want to commit to a dark drawing later, you can. But it's also good if you're inking or cleaning the drawing up some other way with pencil that the, the marks that you made aren't going to be so hard to get rid of. You'll be able to see your, your finishing clearly. You might even want to be able to keep some of your sketching sometimes because it can look nice, people like that. Uh, or if you want to get rid of it, it's easy to either in the case of erasable ink, erase. It's harder to erase a, a, a darker, coarser mark. Or use the Photoshop color replace trick that I posted a video about. I actually keep a lot of my rough drawing. It ends up becoming part of the shading, but it's good to have the decision-making option about that. So with the brush, what I just did without thinking about it really, was control my line weight almost entirely by sight, because there is no tactile feedback. So I'm going now and reinforcing the contours. Spotting some more blacks. Let's get those teeth in. So you have to learn to really look at what you're doing, look closely if you need glasses, wear your glasses, and see when the brush is just touching the surface. Practice making the finest lines you can. Use marker paper or really super ivory smooth or smooth finish paper. Printer paper, cartridge paper that goes in printers will work. It's not bad bleeds a bit more. Uh, with a brush like this where it's a fountain brush, so this is a Kirataka number eight. There's also uh, a long time user of the classic Pentel pocket brush. I've been using that since the mid 90s. I've had many of these. They can do a very fine line. They also have a, a slightly thicker brush, so you can do a nice big wedge. I also quite like the, uh, where'd it go? There it is. This is a, a Pentel, it's a fine, it's a thin brush. Pentel again, same maker as the pocket brush. But it's a very thin brush and long, so it's good for long contour lines. The longer, thinner brushes, sort of like what they use for pinstriping, when you pull, they kind of follow in the line, and you can make a really nice, elegant line. Um, 
It's also long, so it lets you do a very large swipe as well, because there's a long blade to the length of the brush. Um, let's use that to demonstrate another thing. So we did feathering and a deadline, and then there's sort of something else that you can explore. Like I used this when I was doing the stitching on Kniff's uh, pilot's sleeve here. On well, the version that I did, I used a, a stabbing stroke here. So that's going forward. And people often do this by accident, attempting to feather. Because you're feathering, you start way back. So like, here's my hand. This is the middle of the stroke distance. This is my comfortable stroke range. And right in the middle is the mid, mid of it. If you're doing feathering, you want to start back from the middle. You'll do much better feathering that way and it allows you to lean into the stroke to get a nicer, smoother line. If you start in the middle, you almost always get a very short stroke, first of all, and it's hard not to get a bit of a stabbing motion happening. Now, that's not really the best for feathering, but you can do some really good little flick textures with that. And this is not a flicking movement. If you do flicking, you'll get dry brush streaking. I was mentioning that, so like before I mentioned the different fountain pens. The flow control on fountain brushes, fountain pen brushes, is controlled by gravity. So whether you get dry brush effect or not, has a lot to do with the combination of how much ink flows through them, how wet they are, how absorbent the paper is, and how thin the ink is which is actually brush of how wet the brush is. So how quick the flow is and how, how absorbent the paper is. If you have a very absorbent paper, then that will happen quicker. So for example, this is some XMA paper on the Book Studies in class of one of our models. And on that, I can get a dry brush effect really quickly just by flicking stroke. But I can get it here, but it's less pronounced than it is on the mixed media paper, partially the texture, but it's also partially the absorbency of the paper. So, those are a few tips for my cartooning, making comics, and dynamic drawing students. I'm a big fan of using the brush, and you will want to practice it doing things like just the pattern exercises, because doing it on drawings only takes a more time and it's more difficult to focus on the mechanical skill that you're trying to perfect because you're also trying to figure out the anatomy and perspective and shading and composition and all the other things about the drawing that you're doing. Um, pattern exercises uh, is something that I prescribe for all my students. They might seem a little tedious, it's like doing handwriting exercises, but it, it really is like doing handwriting exercises for a drawing because if you really want to be a master calligrapher, you've got to practice the forms. Likewise, to really be a great draftsman and dynamic artist, uh, you need a, a wide range of control and uh, skills with your tools. So I always say do it with all of them, not just your brush. Start with a the pencil, then uh, work on refining stuff too. So, you know, rough some things. Do some rough lines. I'm just going to make some scribbles. And then experiment, clean them up with a soft pencil. This is a 2B. So these are cleanup lines. We call them an animation. Nice, smooth, steady, but not... We're not talking sketchy strokes. Clean, smooth strokes. Um, and then practice with your brush. Also, if you're going to work with a nib or a fountain pen, I do, you'll want to do the same. So I've, I've recently started playing with those again. I never was a fan of nibs. Get this one going. They're challenging. I'm still getting comfortable with them. I can draw with them quite comfortably, but my pattern exercise work with them is still quite crude. It's like a feathering stroke, which they don't do so well. That's the medium. Yeah, 
but for my fine. It'll be a while, probably give me a few more months before I feel like I'm as competent with those as I am with my other tools. This is my extra fine, which I've used the most. And my skill with pens and other devices does pay off a bit, but I'm still getting the hang of it. Pigment pens, which is what I've been using most of my professional life, benefit from the same exercises. I quite like them because, for example, they are receptive to things like feathering. Let's get one that's a little wet, fresher. There we go. You can feather a line or do a dead line. So, I still quite like them. And pigment pens are permanent. Pit pens are basically a form of pigment pen, if you're wondering. There's many different kinds, many different brands make them Coptic, Sakura. Uh, these are Pilot. Um, Prismacolor, Stadler. I just got some Coptic ones recently. They're pretty good. Uh, haven't used them long, but we got a nice, nice line. They're defined by the metal barrel structure with the, the black felt nib that is actually wrapped in a, a, a plastic layer. So you're only writing with the tip of a pigment pen, not the uh, the uh, the whole black area. And then they use pigment ink, which is semi-permanent, pretty permanent once it's dry, and stays nice and black. Um, I also really quite like ballpoint pens. So I'll, I have a few black, different kinds of inks. I find them to be an excellent drawing tool as well. So, but really, this was about the brush and the different kinds of strokes you can do with it. You can work on making up quite a few. Once you've kind of figured out the basics, you end up inventing strokes as you need them for particular jobs to describe different shapes and surfaces. So, little feathering lines to suggest the edge of, for example, this visor. So, a black line and then that wasn't good. There we go. That's better. Little feathered strokes. This effect here, it's partially dry brush effect, but it's basically just pulling in down and going a little bit fast to get the dry brush. And he's probably, he wasn't using a fountain brush, so he was taking advantage of a, a dip brush that he didn't have very wet. So when you're doing a study of another artist's work, trying to figure out how they did what stroke was used to do what mark. So your study might end up looking, you know, I think eventually would definitely work towards having something where you're trying to emulate their work. Uh, or the advocate or using my course, as, as you've seen in this example we saw in the video I posted. Um, but sometimes you can also just be sitting there with a, I encourage, blow up the art, let's get big, uh, get a better sense of how the artist knew it. Ideally, if you can, find out what size they worked at and blow the art up to that. Um, and then attempt to emulate the different strokes you're seeing on just a scrap piece of paper experiment. You don't have to do the whole drawing. Try to get the shapes that you're seeing. The, short feathers and the way they drew a circle and all the little things. Isolate them and try to understand them. Uh, then 
for the study series, I recommend doing some sketches, small compositional studies. So that would be like a, a little, you make a little box. And you say, okay, uh, well, my frame is going to be this shape because that's the shape of the original. And there's foreground element. And uh, a background element. And then some extreme foreground elements with the structure of the plane, which is also kind of going behind the main character. and for a distant stuff. Figuring that out, even on that level, just thinking it out, makes you look more closely at it. And the more time you spend looking closely at things, you notice details. And then think about, you know, how does he do certain things? Like something that tripped up my students in class was the way he drew his eyes. Um, everyone was trying to rationalize them, so... And I had... this going on and there's a little hint at the bottom notice that it's not an enclosed eye with all sides it's left open and then a lot of people were trying to draw a round pupil but in fact what Kniff did was have the character looking far off to the left so he just drew this kind of wedge shape which is not really what it would look like it's definitely why I would say this is falls into the, the school of cartooning Noticing things like that are, is part of the study process, paying attention to these details. Um, and then, uh, if you've done all the little parts, in the compositional study, I did this uh, gridded, we gridded some of the NF art, I printed it out, and then we printed out gridded paper too, I made a diagonals here, and sketched copy and then I light tabled that with the picture of the part next to it to do thank you study. Okay that's it. That's my 20 minutes or so of tutorial tips and things about studying, how to use a brush and your other tools, how to do a study series and etc. Uh, the goal here isn't to forge art to fool anybody. It's not uh, a question of trickery. It's trying to understand uh, the techniques, uh, emulate them, and then apply the parts that you find most attractive or interesting to your own work. Uh, and just generally become more informed as an artist. So that's it for now. Uh, sorry it's a long video. If you want to speed these things up, remember there's a little control thing in the gear controls on YouTube. You can speed the video up a little. And I sound like a little more like a chipmunk, but it goes faster. And uh, don't forget, if you would like to become a student patron, uh, you can pledge on patreon.com slash salgood, and I will appraise your homework and talk to you once a month uh, about progress in your work and give you personal directed instruction. Uh, check that out. Go to spilldink.org to get my books, uh, either digital or in print, and subscribe to the channel if you want to catch more tutorials to work on stuff on your own. Have a good time. Keep doodling. Remember to enjoy the art. It's for fun first and foremost, because if you don't enjoy doing this, it won't be much fun as a career either. And uh, no one gets everything right at the beginning. Remember that. You're going to make a lot of messes. Make the messes bravely, boldly, and go forward and doodle. Take care, kids. Cheerio.